verse, verse 18. That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation of faith to live upon the whole table. He said, it is impossible for, what, for God to do what? Can't lie. See, it is impossible. Eh? Hebrew chapter 6, we are reading from verse 12 to 20. Hebrew chapter 6, from, from verse 12 to 20. He said, by two immutable, what, what, what were those two immutable things? The Bible said by two immutable, look at tell me what those two immutable things are. Nehemiah said by two immutable, look at verse 18. Said by two in that by two immutable things, equals it is impossible. He said by two things, make it impossible for God to lie. Nehemiah, what are those two things? You don't know. Yes, honey. What are those two things? Mm-hmm. Bobo, what are those two immutable things? The Bible says, by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. He said, those two immutable things make it impossible for God to lie. What are those two immutable things? So he made an oath and mm -hmm. closed the promise. He exactly. He gave the promise and then he swore. See? When, let me... <laughs> Check the Bible very well. Whenever God swears, that is it. He cannot change it. That is why, for example, he could not forgive Moses. But when Moses committed that error, God he said, I swear you will not enter. So by the time Moses was coming around and fasting and begging God, please change your mind. God can never change his mind once he has sworn. So when he said, I swear, that is it. And so the Bible said by this, so the promise, he gave a promise, and at the same time, he swore. Those are the two immutable things. It's just like, you know, I, I used to illustrate it like this. Can you imagine, you know in those days, uh, our forefathers, they were idol worshippers. I can still remember in our house, there is this small room that is dedicated to the worshipping of this idol. Actually, this, this officer that used to appear, he, he, he goes there. And uh, they have a pot there. They have all this paraphernalia that they use. And once in a while, they want to do sacrifice. They will go and sacrifice to, to the thing and then cook it. And when we eat as children... It was, it was the most sacred, most sacred room. Not everybody can enter that room. Actually, they said that if a woman, maybe in that period, enter that place, she would die. So it was a very sacred place in the house. And our grandfather only entered that room when he's going to pray or he's going to make sacrifice. Now, when, we, when a new person, when a new woman a, a, in the last family, like, uh, like when my father will take a new wife, he had about four of them, they will take the woman, the final, uh, uh, the final destiny of, uh, of uh, the, the covenant of marriage, they will take the woman into that room. And then the woman will sit down there and they will make some pronouncement. Now, you will never uh, uh, poison your husband. She will say amen. You will never uh, uh, do anything to harm your husband. She will say amen. They will be saying that thing before. It's a very sacred place. Now, let me, let me tell you this. Let me, let me ask you this. Can you imagine our grandfather who was worshipping that thing? If our grandfather will give, give you a promise. He we call it, say, my son, I am going to, uh, I'm going to give you uh, 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 20, 20 naira when you want to go to school. 20 naira was a lot of money in those days. I'm going to give you 20 naira. And then, and then he will take you. He will take you to that room. And he will lay his hand on that idol. I said, I swear by this idol that 
on, on, on Tuesday when you are going to school, I am going to give you 20 naira. Now let me ask you, how many of you will still doubt? Will you still doubt your grandfather that he's going to do it? And why? Why, why? why will you not doubt him? He gave you a promise and he swore. It is almost impossible for him to fail, even as a human being. See? So, that, that is exactly what God did. God, he, he gave us a promise, and at the same time, he swore. So, every promise you have here, brethren, he swore to by God, who cannot lie. So, that is the first pillar. Pillar number one, the promise is given to God, to you, who, by God, who cannot lie. Let's look at pillar number two. Pillar number two is that he is able he is able to perform what he has promised. Sometimes sometimes even when a man has swore, even when a man has, he may discover that he is unable to do it. He may discover that he is unable to do it. Maybe the poor man was expecting some money from somewhere. And the money never came. And he said, my son, I'm about to go to school, but I don't have money. Though I promise you. But God is not like that. He is more than able. It's not that he is able. The Bible says he is more than able. There are no constraining factors. He does not have constraining factors. God does not. God cannot now tell you, Lucy, I, I was expecting some money from somewhere. Now I did not get. So I'm sorry, my son. It's not like that. Let, let, let look, look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians. So pillar number two, he is more than able. He is not just able, he is more than able. He has no constraining factors. See, he has no constraining factors. There are some of these politicians that will give you a lot of promises when they are coming in. But by the time they got there, they discovered that uh, things are not like that. He was not actually lying. But now, he discovered that there are constraining factors. There are constraining factors. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, the Bible says that, Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Does your Bible read like that? Some, some people are still looking for it. I can see your face. You are still looking for it. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Let's read that again. It said, Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. It is on, he is able, more than able. And so the Bible says that there is nothing that is impossible before him. Matthew chapter 19 verse 26. Let's look at Matthew chapter 19 verse 26. We are looking at this second pillar. God is able Every promise you see in the Bible, God is able. Leave this young man alone. Just leave him alone. He's not disturbing anybody. <laughs> God is able. God is able. Look at... F, uh, uh, it, it, so where we read in Ephesians 3, 20, he said, he is more than able. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. The Bible says, and Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Do you see it there? Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Are we all there? Bobo, can you read it for me? Matthew 19, verse 26. Okay. Matthew 19, verse 26. Mm -hmm. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them with men this is impossible but with God all things are possible with God all things are possible so he has no constraining factors men have a lot of constraining factors a man can give you a promise genuinely from his heart he's not deceiving you 
He really wants to help you. But by the time you come around, he says, sorry, I can't do it. And you may be thinking, oh, he, he really wanted. Let's say somebody was promised some amount of money. He thought that, you know, the business he would have done, they said they are going to pay him on, uh, on Monday. So he tells you, by Wednesday, I should be able to give you this money. But if something happened on Monday, the, your, the money did it come. He said, I'm sorry. So with men, there are so many things that are impossible. He said, but with God. All things. You know, there is a funny prayer I used to pray. I said, God, you can change my yesterday. Only God can do that. Do you know God can do it? God can change your yesterday. Oh, they say yesterday is gone. You can't do anything about it. God can do something about it. He can change your yesterday. He has no constraining factors. He, does not. he has no constraining He said, with men. This is impossible, but with God, he said, all things, not some things, all things are possible. You see, that is why when he stood, look at Genesis, let's look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. When Jehovah himself stood before Abraham, he asked Abraham a very simple question. He asked Abraham a very simple question. He said, is, any, is there anything to add for the Lord? Oh, I like that. That statement. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Only if you see it, you read it for me. Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Just the first part. Genesis 18, verse 14. He said, Is there anything to add for the Lord? That is what he has Abraham. 14, yeah. That's all. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Because here, yeah, uh, uh, Abraham was now wavering. Abraham will look at himself, he was, you know, <laughs> reproductively, he was dead. Uh, he looked at Sarah. Sarah, a biological clock stopped many, many years back. And really, it's just in, in Genesis chapter 17. When God showed up to Abraham, Abraham laughed. <laughs> when God said, oh, you are going to have a baby. It was Abraham, it, the Bible said he fell down with laughter. <laughs> in, in verses 3 and 17. He fell down with laughter. He, he was, that is the, the father of faith. He was driven to that stage. And that is why in, in chapter 18, when God now looked at Abraham, he said, is he anything? That is too hard for me. Brethren, there is nothing too hard for him. There is nothing you can ask from him that he cannot do. Is, is, there, any, is there anything too hard for me? And that question was answered in Jeremiah 32 verse 17. Let's look at Jeremiah 32 verse 17. We are still looking at this pillar, pillar number two. He is more than able to perform what he has promised. He is more than able. There is no... There is no wall of Jericho. There is no deadness of Sarah's womb. There is no, there is no problem that can stand against the promise that he has given. We can believe him. In, in, in Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17. He said, ha! I like the way that verse started. You know, he said, ah! <laughs> Lord God. Does your Bible read like that? 32, Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 32, maybe some people you are, you are opening to the wrong place. Are we all there? Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. He said, Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heaven and the earth with a great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Do you see? What is, what is, what is, what is, the Bible says, there is what? There is nothing too hard for him. There is nothing too hard for him to do. So whatever problem that you are going through, brethren, whether it is uh, physical, financial, whatever difficulties you are going through, the God you are serving, there is nothing too hard for him to do. Nothing. He can change your yesterday. He can change the situation. You see, because he is faithful. 
He is more than able. He is more than able. He is more than able. Pillar number three. Pillar number three. He watches over his word to perform it. He watches over that word. We are looking at the five pillars that hold his faithfulness. Brother, don't forget. Whenever you see any promise in the Bible, remember these five pillars. Remember these five pillars that hold the faithfulness of God concerning every promise you find in the Bible. You see, he watches over that world to perform it. He watches over it. He, 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 when, you see, a man can give a promise and he may forget, but not God. When God gives a promise, he watches over it to perform it. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1, 11 and 12. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, 11 and 12 says that. Jeremiah chapter 1, 11 and 12. Jeremiah chapter 1. Say, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me and said, Jeremiah, what seest thou? That I see a rod of an eye of, of an armor tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will esteem my word to perform it. That, that's not a very good translation. The, the good translation should be, I watch over my words to perform it. Actually, the, the amplifier said, I am alert and active and watching over my word to perform it. That is what uh, 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 the, the amplifier. So, he said, I watch over my word to perform it. I am watching over it. See? So, when God has given a promise, he is watching to see who will believe that promise. So, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Verse 9a. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Baby, you are, going to, you are going to read it for me if you see. He said, the eyes of the Lord... Go what uh, 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 go through uh, the eyes of the Lord. Go through the eyes of the Lord. Go throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards Him. The eyes of the Lord is going throughout the whole earth. Second Chronicles sixteen verse nine. Second Chronicles sixteen verse nine. Can you read it? The eyes of the Lord. Hmm. <laughs> Amen. So the eyes, leave him alone. Let him enjoy him. So leave him. He's not disturbing you. <laughs> so the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. To do what? To show himself strong in the behalf of those who are. So the, the eyes of the Lord, they are running to and fro throughout the whole earth. Waiting for that person, that woman, that man, who will actually stand on the promise that he has given. Are, are you listening to me? Say so the eyes of the Lord run through our flow, throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. So, the first pillar, as we said, we are looking at the five pillars that hold you are welcome. The five pillars are hold the promises of God. The Bible said that he is faithful that promise. He is faithful that promise. So we are saying that every promise you find in the Bible is given to you. Number one, by God who cannot lie. That is pillar number one. Number two, it is given to you by God who is more than able to do what he has promised. Number three, he is given to you by God who watches over his word. He watches over it to perform it. He watches over his word to perform it. Now, we are still looking at this pillar number three. Pillar number three, he watches over his word to perform it. Let's look at uh, uh, Isaiah 55. Let's read from verse 8 to 11. Uh, Isaiah 55. We are reading from verse 8 to 11. 
55. Isaiah 55. Say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, hear the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, even so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain coming down from heaven and the snow from as for as the rain coming down the snow from heaven and return on earth with the bow, water the earth and make it, it uh, and make it, it bread and it bring forth uh, uh, bread to the eater, food to, uh, bread to the eater uh, and seed to the planter. He said, Even so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. He said, It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that for which I please, and it shall prosper the thing whereof to ascend it. We are seeing. So people are still opening to the Bible. So let's let me wait. We are going to read it again. Because some of you are still opening to the Bible. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 5, 5, 55, chapter 55. I am reading from verse 8 to verse 11. Isaiah chapter 55. Are we all there? We are all there now. We are reading from verse 8 to verse 11. Isaiah 55. He said, and it reads like this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, say the Lord. For as the earth is, as for the heaven is higher than the earth, even so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain coming down and the snow from heaven, I return on earth with about water in the day, I'm making it bring forth and pour that it may give bread to the eaters and seed to the sower. He said, Even so shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall complete for which it is, um, for which it is, uh, for which I, uh, I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereof to ascend it. You understand? So he, he said, The word of God, once it is spoken, I mean, it, it is like a seed, a viable seed that has been planted. Even though you can't see it, it is covered. Even though, just wait. When the appropriate time comes, like the rain falling upon that seed, it will come up. It will come up. Actually, the Bible said in Luke chapter 8 verse 11 that the word of God is a seed. It's a viable seed. He said, he said, my word cannot return unto me void. I see. Now, God, if only you know, if only you know the, 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 the power behind that word. If only you know. You see, one of the things, uh, one, of the, one of the things I normally watch, whether it's on radio, uh, uh, television or or on the internet, there are two things. When you see, when I go to the internet or the television, only two things. Sometimes news, but I discover the news is always uh, nonsense now. This documentary, I like documentary, historical documentary. Oh man, you know, and one of those things I really like is the the history of of Israel, for example. Yeah, I'm never tired of. Looking at those documentaries. Look at, if you really want to know that this Bible is correct. If you really want to know that God is here. You look at Israel. You look at Israel. Before they were scattered in AD 70. He told them. If, right from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. He said, you are going to be scattered all over the world. And I will make sure that you are the most hated people on earth. Now, anti-Semitism, where does it come from? Even if they ask Hitler, why did you hate the Jews? He doesn't have a reason. But God said, that is what he said. He said, I will make you reproachable. People will hate you without a cause. And that is how they have hated them. And God scattered them all over the world for over 2,000 years. There was no nation called Israel. There was no nation called Israel. But if you look at the book of Amos <laughs> and the book of Hosea, chapter 14, he said, look, I will bring you back home. 
He said, I will bring you back. He said, when I bring you back, anybody that will be dreaming of ever driving you again from that land, he said, he will be a dreamer. He will just be dreaming. Look at what happened. In 1947, the United Nations came together and said, look, Palestine should be divided among the Jews and the Arabs. And the Arabs said, no way. That's not, what, what is the Jew? What is that? They are not coming here. And 1947, the United Nations divided the land. And that is where the, the, the Arabs first missed it. The Jews said, yes. The Israelis said, okay, we are okay. If you want to divide the land, we are okay. Give us our own portion so that we can move there. You saw the world. They were already moving all the way from Europe, all the, the, the places they suffered. They were already coming in. And the British that was in charge were always sending them back. Actually, this ship, Exodus, when it landed in, in, in Tel Aviv, they had to return it to Turkey. 5,000 Jews that survived the Holocaust. They, they said, where are you going? They pushed them back to Turkey. In 1947, Ben Gurion said, look, we are going to, the, 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 the United Nations have divided the land. When they divided it among the Palestinians and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the Israelis, the Israelis were very happy they took their own. The, the, the Palestinians said, no way, we are going to drive them out. Actually, all that they were saying, they, they, they did not even argue against the uh, in, in, in United Nations. What they said is, if you, if you divide our land, we are not going to argue with you. We will just send armed uh, uh, arm forces there and try to the, the everybody away. What? The, even America was afraid. America told, the president then told the Bergurion, don't declare a state. Because if you do that, the Arabs will drive you out. And Ben-Gurion, May 14, he declared the state of Israel. May 14, when he declared the state of Israel, May 15, May 15, 40 million Arabs, 40 million. I mean, with all the arms, with all the, uh, 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 I mean, it was a huge army from Syria, from Egypt, from Lebanon, from as far as Saudi Arabia. They all put an army together. It was such a powerful army. That even America said there is no hope. Even when the Jews tried to buy harm from America, America said, don't waste your time. This state you have declared will only last for a few days. Because there is no way you are going to withstand this huge army. Imagine most of them that were, that were fighting that war, go and check it. They did not even have some half gun, no bullets. They don't have one single armor tank. And they have about, the, the Arabs will have more than 40,000. They don't have a single war plane. The Arabs had about 200. Mobilized from Egypt, from, and they started the war. When that war started in 1948, in short, they so much overrun that land, they were just about 20 kilometers away from Tel Aviv. When the Haganah, the Haganah, the, 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 the Raktag army that were fighting, they eventually succeeded in buying guns from Czechoslovakia. Because America could not even give them guns. France refused to give them guns. Britain refused to give them guns. Because they were saying, it is a hopeless case. Why do you fight a war that you are so much sure to, win, to, to lose? So there is no hope. Now, when the girls came from Czechoslovakia, because the Bible says you can't drive them out once they are back. No way. That is what this Bible says. Now, <coughs> they, started, they started, the war turned. Do you know what happened one time? Oh, man, God is wonderful. God's word, brethren, when you see any promise here, hold to it. It is it's not just an honorary book. It's not just an honorary book. Do you know what happened? On May 26, when the war was so strong and it was almost as if 
they are going to be overrun. May 26, the rain started falling. And they said it is like, uh, what happened that day was like, can you imagine, January is the, is the coldest month in, in Canada. Can you imagine in January, we have temperature of 32 degrees centigrade in January? Is that possible? If that happens, is that normal? 32 degrees, hot summer in January or December. The coldest month now becomes the hottest month. When the rain started falling, the Ar among the Arabs, so the soldiers, it was, it, it was not even the, the, Palestine, the, the Israeli that started the news. They said, run. The, the Israelis, they have thrown an atomic bomb. That is why this rain is falling. It's just a rumor. Among those Egyptian soldiers, they say, run. It's just, the commanders gave an eye, gave, 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 run for your life. <laughs> because they have used an atomic bomb. That is why this rain is falling. That's how everybody ran. That's how they abandoned everything. Egypt ran back. Syria ran this way. Lebanon ran this way. That was it. The war was over. One of the next war they fought was 1956 over the Suez Canal. Then the next one was the Six Day War of 1967. That one was even more miraculous. In 1967, um, Abdul Kaman said, we are now going to wipe. We have the arms now. He said, he said we are going to wipe out Israel in six hours. When they asked the king of Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia sent in their, their troops, then uh, Iraq sent in their troops, Iran, um, he said, Algeria gave a blank check to, to, to the Arabs. He gave the 500 million. He said, get arms anywhere in the world. We are going to wipe out Israel. He so said, we will do it in six hours. So when they were talking about the commander of, of Syria, the commander of Syria said, this war is going to be very fast. Six hours, there will be no nation called Israel. No? And when the war, <laughs> before the war could start, <laughs> oh man. You see, what, look, look, look at General Moshe Dayan. Jeremiah Dayan, who was the defense minister of Israel, what he did, when they were interviewed, he said, well, this war, this is a war, this is the final war. He saw the, the, the rabbi, they were already consecrated the, the, the grave where people will be buried. They have consecrated the grave for mass burial because it was, it, was, it was such a war that there was no way Israel will ever exist anymore. There was no way. And Moshe Dayan, when the war started, actually on day one, on day one, it's so not just the whole day, about six, three hours in that day, Israel knocked out the entire Egyptian air force. They knocked them out, knocked out Syria, knocked out Lebanon, within six hours, knocked their, their air force out completely. And 100,000 soldiers that were in the desert, in, in the Sahara Desert, had to, 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 to just surrender. Actually, what the problem they were actually having is this. You, eh? Yeah. They win so many things. The first thing they discover is that a commander cannot give command to his troop in the front. With, with, the, with, the, with their talkie talkie, walkie talkie. The walkie talkie, all their radio stopped walkie talking. The radio, they were all dead. Can you imagine? <laughs> you, you are a commander now. The, the forces in your front, you can't tell them what to do. They can't hear you. And then, you saw there were so many things that happened. Like that dust. The dust we just raised like that. Pa, pa, pa. And it can separate you, you and the... Uh, you and, uh, and your fellow soldiers, you can't see each other. But the, the Israelis can, sh can see everything. I mean, God, God, for why? Why did God do all that? Because he watches over his word to perform it. He said, when I bring you back, go and read it in the book of Amos. He said, the whole world will gather together to try to push you from that. He said, they will not, they will not, they will not do anything. 
in Zechariah chapter 19, 12, verse 3, he said, look at, look at, the, you, this Bible is wonderful. This Bible is wonderful. I'm telling you, this is not just an honorary book. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 13, he told, he said, at the last day, he said, the issue is going to be Jerusalem. So that is the issue. That's going to be the issue, Jerusalem. So what is the problem uh, in, the, in, 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 in that land today? Do you know it is all over Jerusalem? Not here. The Palestinians said, we want our own state. The, 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 the Israelis said, yes, we will give you your own state. But what is the issue? Jerusalem must be our capital. And the Jews, they are saying, one each, you will not get. That's the issue now. That's just the issue. Jerusalem. And how did Zechariah, more than 2,000 years ago, know that Jerusalem is going to be the issue? So that is the issue. So when God gives a promise, brethren, he watches over it. That Bible you are carrying is not just another book. It's not just a history book. He watches over it. God is faithful, that promise. If he has promised it, there is nothing. You can, you can do whatever you want to do. You can holler. You can do everything. If he has promised it, there is nothing anybody can do about it. Amen. Number four. Pillar number four. Is that he has one of your shoes. See? And he is able to bear with us. That's a very wonderful pillar, you know. Brethren, the problem you are going through now is not new to him. He became a man. He wore your shoes. The shoes you are wearing now. So you, oh, oh, the pastor doesn't even know how the shoes is pitching me. Don't, I'm saying that Jesus wore those shoes before you wear them. He wore them. He became a man. That is why he left his glory. And he became a man. That he will be able to be here with us. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 10 and 11. And then 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 2. He said, He became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things to make the captive of their, of their salvation perfect through suffering. Verse 11 said, for he that sanctified are they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call their brethren. In verse 16, he said, He did not take the, the, the stature of, of an angel, but he took the seed of Abraham, that he might be able to bear with us. Kahalu, you are going to read for me. We are looking at Hebrew chapter 2. Hebrew chapter 2. I, I like your reading. Can you give him the give her the mic? Hebrew chapter 2. First of all, verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 and 11. Okay. For it became him for whom... Yeah. <laughs> for it became him for whom are all things, and by whom all things... In, um, for whom all things mm -hmm. in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captive of the salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctified and that... And they are sanctified. And they who are sanctified. And they who are sanctified are all of one. one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Okay, 16 and 17. He said he took not the nature of angels. 16? 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. For verily he took, all, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it be, behoves him to be met unto to be made like unto the brethren, mm. that he might be merciful and faithful, high priest in things pertaining to God, mm. to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Okay. To make reconciliations for the sins of the, the people. Sins of the people. So, so the, the, he said, he did not take the nature of an angel. What what nature did he take? The seed of Abraham, of a man. See, he, he that is why he became one of us. God became one of us. He took all the, he, he, the Bible says he did not take all the nature of an angel, but he took on him the nature of, of a man, the seed of Abraham, so that he wore your shoes. Let me tell you, whenever you have a pain in your stomach, 
Always knowing that Jesus suffered it too. He had it. Hello? You have a pain wherever. Whatever difficulties you are going through, he wore your shoes. Before you wear them, he has already worn them. That is why he took on the seed of Abraham. He did, the Bible said he did not take on the seed of, of, of an angel. But he took the seed of Abraham. So that he will be able to be here with us. He said in all things it behoved to be made according to his brethren. That he may be a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So he became one of us. He became one of us. That is the revelation we, re re we really have in this message. That the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus Christ of the New. He, he, he only became a man. He became a man. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, which are so close. Romans chapter 8, we, we are reading from 28 to 32. Romans chapter 8. Romans said, and we know. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 8, from verse 28 to 32. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Are we all there? Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, from whom he did for no, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first man among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, he also just, and whom he just also glorified. Verse 31 said, Therefore, if God be for who can be against us, verse 32 said, He that spared not his son. He that spared not his son, but delivered it from us all. How will he not with him, with him also freely give us all things? If he has given us his son, how will he not give us all things? How will he not give us all things? So the Bible says that whom he did predestinate, he also did, he, 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 he predestinated us that we may conform to the image of his son. That he may be the firstborn above many brethren. He may be the firstborn. So Jesus Christ is your maker. Jesus Christ is also your brother. Hallelujah. Do, do you understand that? He is your maker. He is your brother. He said that he might be the firstborn above many brethren. He is your brother. Look, if Jesus is to see you along the road, he will call you brother good news. That's what he will call you. Yeah, that's why he will call you. The Bible said in, in April 2 11, he said he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Even with all our 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 faults. With all he is so holy and we are so unholy. He is so perfect and we are so imperfect. But the Bible said he is not ashamed to call us brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. That's what he will call you if he sees you along the road. The Bible says we are made to conform to the image that he will be the firstborn among many brethren. Pillar number five as we close now. Ikeas. Pillar number five. Let me tell you, brethren, Ikeas. Ikeas for you. Ikeas for every one of us. The Bible says that even the hairs on your head are numbered. Ikeas for you. He cares for you. Let, let's look at Peter 5, 7. And we are closing now. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. He said, He cares for you. He cares for you. Carlo, can you read it for me? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. As we close now. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Brethren, he cares for you. And it is not that care that actually hold. This, these are the five pillars that hold his faithfulness. So we are closing now. We are saying that, the Bible says that God is faithful. So every promise he has given here, you can hold to it. Every promise. If he said that by his you were healed, that is it. If he said that the angel of the Lord are coming around you, the angel is there whether you see him or not. If, if whatever promise that he gives to you, these four pillars will hold every promise you find in the Bible. Pillar number one, the promise is given to you by God who cannot lie. The Bible said it is impossible for God to lie. 
Pillar number two, he is more than able to carry out the promise, so he cannot give you a promise that he is unable to perform. Pillar number three, he watches over that word to perform it. Pillar number four, he has worn your shoes. And pillar number five, he cares. He cares for you. So these five pillars hold every promise you find in the Bible. Amen. Any question before we pray? Any question? Twenty-eight, Matthew chapter twenty-eight, Matthew chapter twenty-eight, and uh, we're going to read from verse nineteen. Oh, verse eighteen rather, Matthew chapter twenty-eight, from verse eighteen, <coughs> and Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore into all, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we commit this word that we have read now into your hands. It takes the inspiration of the Almighty to have understanding of what this means. And when that inspiration comes, it's going, to, it's going to create wonders. The sick will be healed, the blind will see, the lame will walk. Oh Lord, our Father, open our eyes to see, to understand, to know what this means. That I am with you even unto the end of the world. I am with you. What does that mean that you are with us? Help us now, Lord Jesus. O oh God, our Father, in you is strength, in you is power. In you, O oh God, we can conquer every enemy that comes our way. But it takes the inspiration of your word in our heart to do that. Help every one of us this morning. But Lord, it is you speaking to us. Lord, you know where our weaknesses are. You know where we struggle. I pray, Father, that you will address those needs this morning. And your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you very much for coming this morning. We feed on the word of God. Is the best thing we can feed on. And uh, we certainly appreciate the Lord for his word we had this morning. God is faithful to his word. Every time he is faithful. Here Jesus has risen from the dead. And he was commissioning his disciples. He said, all power is given to me. In earth and in heaven. All power is given to me. Go ye therefore into the world and preach the gospel. Teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you unto the end of the world. Lo, I am with you unto the end of the world. Last Sunday we were speaking on destiny. And one of the things we mentioned was that the devil will try to make you think that God is not with you. And that there is no hope for you on the face of this earth. Oh, everything is just turning upside down. Everything is working against you. And we saw that 
God had a, has a destiny for every one of us. If you go out to the store to buy a pair of shoes, there's a reason you bought that pair of shoes to wear them. If you bought clothes, there's a reason you bought those clothes to wear them. So if God sent you into the world, there's a reason he sent you. There's a purpose why he sent you here. And that purpose is your destiny. He has a purpose for that, why he sent you here. And he will achieve that purpose through you. Because that is why he placed you here. And he has said that I am not going to leave you. I am going to work with you to achieve that purpose. I am going to work with you and through you achieve that purpose. Bring you to that destiny that I've ordained you to be in. Amen. And so I just want to take one part of the things we listed here. The first thing we listed here last Sunday was that know that God is always with you. Know that he is always there with you. Praise God. And we want to take just that one part this morning and look at it through the Bible. And here we find him talking to the disciples here. Say, Lo, I am with you. Why did he say that? He gave them a work to do. He said, Go and teach all nations. This gospel that I've given to you, go and preach it to all nations. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. So a task has been given to them. And the Lord knew they cannot carry out that task all by themselves. Therefore he said, Lo, I am with you. As you go on carrying out that task, remember, I am with you. I am not going to leave you alone. He was the one that called them. And he was the one that was giving them the instruction here to go and do a certain thing. And so he said, I am going to be with you as you carry out my task. Let us go back a little bit and go to Genesis and look at the first person he called out. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Let's just go back there quickly and look at the first person he called out. Genesis chapter 12. <laughs> the Bible said here, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Said, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lord, his brother's son, and all their substances that they had gathered, and the souls that, were, that, that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they so now, this was the first man that God chose to show a relationship between him and man after the fall. The first man that he chose to exemplify, to show, to demonstrate how God would like to relate with man. So we can say this is the first church. They called out. And Abraham was called out. And watch it now, when he was called out, God didn't abandon him. He said, I am going to bless you. I am going to be with you. I am going to keep you. I will cause him that will cause you. And I will bless him that will bless you. 
Last Friday, we were looking at contending. And we saw that God asked us by the word of God to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints. And later we found out that there was another type of contending which was between God and anyone that contend with us. A contending between God and anyone that tried to fight against us. We are not to contend in that situation. That was God's contending. Like he's speaking to Abraham here. I will cause him that cause you. If anyone will cause you, you are not the one to cause them. I will do the cursing. I will bless the one that will bless you. Of course, you have no power to bless anybody. All blessings come from me. I will bless him that will bless you. Therefore, God was with Abraham when he called him out. He did not leave him alone. He walked with him. He was there with him in every situation. He was there with him because he was called out and Abraham obeyed that call. He obeyed that call. He didn't sit down there in Haran and say, oh yeah, let me settle here. No. He got up and went to the place that God called him to go. And when he obeyed, because of that obedience, God decided to follow him wherever he was going. Our brother pointed out something for us this morning that I'd like to uh, uh, re-emphasize uh, again. Said, God watched over his word to perform it. But he, he made a statement, he said, God watch out for those that will believe that word. Then God will perform it. It isn't that God don't know how to perform his word. But he's watching out for those that will believe that word. And when you believe it, he asks upon it to fulfill what he has said that word should do. The word is there. But you have, it is when you believe it, when you trust him enough, then that word kicks start into action. Praise God. That is why unbelievers can just come in here, they believe, they get miracles. They get healed. Because God is watching out for those that will believe it. That word is active. Those that will believe it. If you will believe it, the result of that word will be, will be in your life. But God is always watching. He's watching out for who is going to believe it. That is God's watch. His word is set on in heaven. Nothing to be changed. The word is there. But he's watching out for those who are going to believe it. And anyone that will believe it, that word is automatically kicks into action. Praise God. And when God gave his word to Abraham, say, get out from among your people. Come to this certain land. And Abraham, and he said, I will bless thee. I will multiply thee. I will make you a great nation. I will do that. When Abraham believed that word, how do you know he believed that word? His actions. His actions. After God spoke, he sat down there. He started raising a thousand more cows, a thousand more sheep. No, he got up. He got up, he carried all he had, and he started going. He started going to that land. He didn't stop until he came to Cana. The Bible said, and to Cana they came. He came to Cana, and that was the land. And he sat on there. By acting upon that word, all the blessings that God ever pronounced came upon him. All the blessings. He doesn't have to wait anymore. He doesn't have to do any one more thing. He doesn't have to carry out any one more ritual. No. All the blessings, all the, because he has obeyed that voice, all the blessings came upon him. That was why. When he went to, went to uh, Egypt, and Pharaoh wanted to take his wife. God said, I am not going to let that. He said, hey, he lied. Well, that was not the basis of God's agreement with him. <laughs> that was the basis. The basis was, you get out from among your people. Did he do it? He 
did it. So he settled the matter. As far as God was concerned, he was a prophet. He was his prophet. And God came down to Pharaoh. He said, look, return this man his wife. As you are done, you're finished. Praise God. God was watching over his word. And when that word was obeyed, all the blessings that were connected to that word came upon Abraham. So is the church today. These 12 disciples that were called out and one fell on the way. And these 11 that were continuing after Jesus had resurrected, he came to them. He said, look, all power in heaven and earth belong to me. It's given to me. I've taken the keys of hell and death from Satan. He does not have them anymore. Go ye therefore into all nations, teaching them to observe all things as I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. I am with you to the end of the world. So now, we've seen in the Old Testament how God called out a man and how he was with him all through the journey. And how God had called the disciples now. I'm trying to jump so I can finish what I have here. How God has called the disciples out and he has told them, I am going to be with you. I am not going to leave you. I am going to perform my word to you. Why? Why would the Lord have to be with them? What danger are they going through that he needed to be with them? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He said, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Mind you, chapter 10, verse 16. <coughs> Mind you, 10, 16. So, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sheep among wolves. You know, wolves will just grab the sheep and just rip it apart. Feed it up. But you are not going to be able to do that to a child of God. Because the Lord himself is there with them. So I'm not going to leave you. I am going to be with you always. And because of his presence, the enemy's power is broken from our lives. We can rest on that, that his presence, his presence is here with us. So this was the command that he gave to the church. He said, go ye. Let's go back now to Matthew. I want to emphasize something there. Matthew 28 that we just read. <laughs> so go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. Always. Always. Every time. He is there with you. You know, the Christian today is so afraid. Afraid of this and afraid of that. Oh, will this happen and will that happen? Well, sometimes they will behave as if there is no God. That shouldn't be. You see? Even when Jesus made the promise here, I am with you always. If you have received the Holy Spirit, you need not be afraid. Nothing is going to touch you. No, he cannot break his word. He just will not break his word. Except if you have not given your life to him. You have to be part of the church to claim this blessing. You need to be part of the church. And the church is not this room where we are gathered together. Okay? The church is not any certain building anywhere. The church is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. And you become a, a part of that church by birth. Not by the birth of your mother giving birth to you. No. You are part of that church by the birth of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. If you have your Bible with, with you there. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 12, verse 13. As 
right. He said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. For by one spirit are we all baptized, are ye all baptized into one body. Whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. By one spirit, by the Holy Ghost, we are all baptized into this church of Jesus Christ. By one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Amen. You got to receive the Holy Spirit. And how do you receive the Holy Spirit? You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You accept the sacrifice. The sacrifice that he made for you. You take it personal. He died on the cross for you so that you do not die. He took your place of death so that you can live. He died so that you can live. He was blamed so that you can be pardoned. Hallelujah. He suffered so that you can be free. He was buried. He died and he was buried. And on the third day he rose again. So Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says, verse 9 says, If you will confess the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead for your justification. You shall be saved. That is where to start from. Accept that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was, he that was guiltless became the guilty one. He that was sinless became the sin itself. <laughs> He didn't become a sinner. No, he became the very essence of sin. For your sake and for my sake. If we accept that, and we come to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that's what he told us in his word. He said, go, and, and go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father above planned your redemption. He came down as a son, putting on a human flesh, which he sacrificed on the cross to save you. Because the Father is a spirit, he cannot die as a spirit. The spirit has no blood to shed. But your sins requires blood to be pardoned. But as a father, as a spirit, he has no blood to share. So he made himself a body that has blood in it. And he stepped into that body to carry out the work of redemption. On the cross, he took that body and presented it as a sacrifice for you. That body was sacrificed for you. There was the blood. In that body was the blood that pardoned your sins. And that blood was taken and taken to the, to, to the, to the holy place, taken to heaven and placed on the mercy seat to intercede for you. That blood, it wasn't the blood of goat or the blood of ram, but the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of uh, uh, um, Hebrews chapter 9, down in verse 25, he said, with his own blood, enter into the holy place to make atonement for you. That blood to make atonement for you. Amen. And then why there, why he were ascended up to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit back to the earth. He sent his Holy Spirit to you and to me so that you can be kept in the way of the Lord. By yourself, you cannot walk this road, my brother. By your own self, you cannot live the Christian life. You can't walk the Christian walk by yourself. By your carnal mind, you cannot do it. You need the spirit of Jesus Christ. That is why he told us here in the book of John, chapter 14, 
verse 18. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come back to you. I will come back to you. And he came back on the day of Pentecost and dwelt in the believers. And anyone that we believe today can also receive the Holy Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit we are baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. By the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into that body of Jesus Christ. And then the Bible, would tell, the Bible tells us there in Hebrews chapter, I believe chapter 12, he said, you are now come into the, uh, the church of the living God. The church of the living God in New Jerusalem. Which church? The church of those that are born by the Spirit of God. Those that have received the Holy Spirit into them. They are the ones that are born into this church. Praise God. Hallelujah. He said, I am not going to leave you comfortless. I'm, I'm coming back to you. And he came back to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And here now he began to walk with them. When he came back to them, he began to walk with them. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. To show to you that truly he came back. He walked with them. And that is how he liked to walk with us today. Mark chapter 16. <coughs> Mark chapter 16. I want to start from 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now, right hand of God doesn't mean this right hand, like my right hand here. No, it is the power of God. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them. And confirming the word with signs following. That was the book of Acts. The book of Acts began to manifest. After the Lord spoke to them, on the, they waited because he, they were told to wait. They waited until the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was given. And after the Holy Spirit was given, the Bible said they went out. Preaching the word everywhere. The Lord confirming that word with signs following. He confirmed that word. What he said he will do, he confirmed it because somebody obeyed. Alright? When he told them, he said, Tarry ye yet at Jerusalem. They obeyed, they tarried. They waited at Jerusalem. They didn't jump out and say, oh, I'm going away now to my fishing. I'm going away now to my farm. I'm going away now to go share my sheep. No, they waited. They tarried. Look, there is blessing in obedience. There's, there is blessing when we wait on God. When we take his word and follow it, there is blessing. So when they waited, the Holy Spirit was giving. And then the Lord began to confirm their words as they were preaching. He began to confirm it with signs following them. Because he said, I will not leave you low. I am with you to the end of the world. I am with you. That was the church. I am with you. And he said to two, you are the church. I am the church. If you have truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit into your life. You are the church. You are you have been baptized into that body, that mystical body of Jesus Christ. You are part of that church now. You are there. And God is obligated to keep his word to you. What he said he will do, he's obligated to keep it. So the disciples went forth, preaching the word, and the Lord confirming that word with them, confirming it with signs and wonders, because they were to preach the gospel to all creatures. They were to demonstrate the power of the gospel. That's what it means to preach the gospel. It means demonstrate the power of the gospel. Demonstrate that this is the word of God. And the church today is to demonstrate that this Bible is the word of God. That is what the church is called to do. To demonstrate that this Bible we are, we are carrying, it is the word of God. And it's not for you to prove. You are not the one to prove it. But God is to manifest that through you. The disciples couldn't do anything. It was the Lord who was, con the Bible said the Lord was confirming the word. They preached the word. And the Lord came and confirmed. Yeah, that is what I, asked, I told you to do. Yeah, that is what I said you should do. Yeah, that is what I said you should do. The Lord was the one confirming that word with signs following to prove to the unbeliever that these are my disciples that I have sent to show you the way of life. Let us read Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Why would the Lord be with the disciples? Why would he confirm the world? Why would he go with them? Why was he doing that? Want to build faith in the, on the, in the unbelievers to believe the gospel. Two, to strengthen the believers. All right, Acts chapter 4. Somebody say it, verse 29 to 30. Read it for me. Amen. So here was Peter and the brethren, after that they were threatened, after that, they, they, that great miracle that take place, took place on, the, on their way to the, to the temple, and the people gave heed to what Peter had to say, and the Pharisees were so afraid of what may become, of what has happened, so they called them and they threatened them. So we don't want you to preach in this name again. If you try it again, we'll put you in jail. Don't preach in this name again. The Bible said in verse 20, 23, it said, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. All the threatening that the chief priests, the elders, you know, they threatened them. They went and told their company, told their brethren. This is what they said to us. They threatened us. They said we should not preach in that name again. We should not do this again. Then they lifted up their voices and they prayed to God. The Bible said in verse 29, And now, this is what this was their prayer now. Said, And now, Lord, behold your threatenings. Look at your threatening. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, they, might, they may speak the word. If you look at what, how it is written in King James Version, there is no period. There is no full stop there because it is continuous. It says, grant to the servants that with all boldness they may speak the word by stretching forth thy hand to him and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus said, Behold, you are threatening. Grant to your servants to preach the word with boldness. How would they get that boldness? How, can they, how, how would the Lord make them to have that boldness? He said, By stretching forth your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders. 
before their very eyes. That will give us boldness. So when God does things, is to embolden his people. It's to give them boldness to preach the gospel. When God performs signs and wonders, it is to give boldness to the preachers or to the believers so that they can preach that word with boldness. Praise be to God. We need that today. We need that today. That the believers will have boldness. Because in doing so, the Lord is putting a difference between his people and the unbelievers. He is confirming to the unbelievers that what his people are saying is the correct thing. That the unbelievers need to give ears to what they are saying. Give us boldness to preach the gospel. This is one way the Lord gives boldness to his people. Psalm 67. <coughs> Psalm 67. Let me take you to that. Psalm 67 here. <coughs> Verse 1 to 3. You, 1 to 2, rather. So the psalmist said, yes, Psalm 67. <coughs> said, God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving head among all the people, all the nations. You know what David is saying here? So let the Lord shine his face upon us to put a difference between us and the rest of the world. That is the way that his way will be known. How will the unbeliever know the way of the Lord? We are the ones following the way of the Lord. If the Lord will put a difference between us and them, then we know that the way we are following is the way of the Lord. The way we are, that's what David is saying. The Lord has called us. He has given us his statutes. He has given us his commandment. And we are following it. Let the Lord put a difference between us and those who are not following this way. That way, the whole world will know that this way that we are going on, we are following, is the way of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we know what he did in the land of Egypt. How he did put a difference between the Egyptians and the Hebrews. Ten plagues that struck, none of them happened in the land of Goshen. None of them, he put a difference. The last one, which was the death of the firstborn, oh, before it ever struck, he put a difference. He told Moses, do this and do this and do that. Tell the people, to kill the lamb or a goat and apply the blood on the door. He put a difference. And that night when the dead angel came, he did not touch one soul in the land of Goshen. Because God put a difference. See, that's exactly what we need in our lives. God will put a difference in your life and the life of the unbelievers. God to cause his face to shine upon you. Hallelujah. He has to cause his face to shine upon you. And that will put a difference. The people will see that, yes, there is a difference. He wants to do that. He hasn't abandoned his children yet. If you call upon him and you yield your heart completely to him, he will do it. If you will not be afraid of what the enemy says he's going to do, but you trust in God, he will do it for you. He will put that difference. He wants to put that difference. He likes to put that difference. But he wants you to trust his word. You have to trust that word. You can't run away from it. Because that word is your foundation. 
That is where you need. It's your foundation. It's your protection. It's your everything. Amen. Amen. That is your everything. You need to stand there and be victorious. Isaiah 55. We, I think we read this scripture today, this morning already. <laughs> Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. You know, the way we, we think, is, it's not it's just like uh, a two-year-old child or a year-old child, and, and thinking that he's so smart, he knows everything, he says, oh, no, daddy, you have to do it this way. No, daddy, you have to do it this way. But he doesn't know much. He doesn't know anything yet. But if you can just leave it to the daddy to guide, see, the end result will be so wonderful. The mommy start to make food. Say, no, 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 mommy. No, you have to put this one first and you have to do this first. <laughs> Praise God. See, that is how sometimes we think. We look at the immediate. The immediate. But we don't look at the end result. We don't look at the long term. But God sees the long term. So he takes our hand and he's guiding us through a path. Maybe we just, we are looking at that thing over there. We say, well, if I just walk through here, I will get here quickly. But the Lord knows that you cannot go from here to there as straight as you are looking at it. So he takes your hand and he guides you over there and there and there and he brings you back. Bring you to where you want to be. That is his leadership. Praise God. He knows what he wants, you, he wants for you. Remember now, he was the one that proposed what you should be. The Bible says, according to the grace and pop, according to the purpose and grace that was given unto us. The purpose and the grace that was given unto us. You did not give yourself any purpose coming to the world. No. You didn't give yourself any purpose. He gave you the purpose and he gave you the grace to achieve that purpose. Everything you receive from him. You see? So if he had a purpose, how come you know the way to achieve that purpose? He knows the way to achieve that purpose. He knows how to get to that purpose. And he had a plan of, of how you should get to that purpose. Therefore, he said here, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, but his thoughts are according to his purpose. <laughs> you understand that? His thoughts are according to his purpose. And how can you, who did not make that plan, who doesn't have that purpose, know how to get there? You cannot. You just need to depend on him. You need to depend on him. Because he was the one that made that purpose. And he had a plan how to achieve that purpose. So if we depend on him to take our hands and to lead us, he will bring us into that very purpose that he has for us. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. My thoughts than your thoughts. Look at uh, look at the children of Israel when they came to, to, to Jericho and they were to enter the land. Oh, it was all wall up, high high walls over the city. How were they going to go in? Did God tell Moses how they were going to do it? No. Did he tell Joshua? No, not until that day that he came. He came down himself. But all along, he had that plan in his mind how he was going to do it. It was part of his thought how he was going to do it. But he never revealed it to any of them. He never revealed it to, to Caleb. He never told Joshua about it. He never told Moses about it. It was that day when Joshua went out praying. They were just at the outskirts of, of, of Jericho. He came down and Joshua said, who are you? <laughs> he said, I am the captain of the host of the Lord. Then he bowed down to worship. 
He said, remove your shoe from your feet, because where you stand is holy ground. Not an angel. The Lord himself came down. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know, they probably thought, okay, now uh, let us organize how we are going to attack the city or the weapon we will need and all that. But look at the way God came. Look at his plan. Just walk around. Walk around. Go and rest. Next day, walk around. Go and rest. Survey the land. Go and rest. And as you look, find out where you are going to put your house. <laughs> look around. Look at the mangoes. Look at the cashews. The one you are going to eat, be surveying it. Because you're going to get it there. <laughs> oh, praise be to God. He looked foolish. When you see these armless people, they had no arms. And the people inside the wall were, were armed. No wonder they didn't bother them. They just left there and said, look at them, just foolish. They walk around with no arm, nothing in their hands. And then they go to rest. They do that every day. On the sixth, seventh day, they walk around seven times. And they blew the trumpet. Oh, the war. I can see angels just came, pull the wall up. Everything went down flat. And they fear that the wall fell down flat. The people of Jericho couldn't raise anything. Before they could do anything, they were all slaughtered. They were dead men. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And my ways higher than your ways. The way God wants to pass you through to bring you to that blessing, it is higher than the way you are thinking it. But he has a purpose for your life. And he wants to achieve that purpose. Let him have his way with you. Oh, it will be perfect. It will be a blessing. If you just let him have his way with you, he will bring you to his very purpose in your life. He will bring you there. Amen. Because the purpose of God cannot be defeated. His plans, he must carry it out as he has said it. It cannot be defeated by any man. There is no power that can defeat the very purpose of God. There is no. There is no. Then he said here, yeah. he said, verse 10, For as the, as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not, Tither, but water the earth, and make it, it bring forth and board, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. This is where I stand now. The word that is gone out of the mouth of the Lord cannot return to him void. He shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He shall not return back to him void. And I believe that it will please the Lord for the sick to be healed. It will please the Lord. And he says, yeah, that word, we accomplish that which I please. And it will please the Lord for the sick to be healed. It will please the Lord for the afflicted to be relieved of their affliction. It will please the Lord. And it is the word that came out of his mouth that we need to carry out. It is the word. It came out of his mouth. That is what he commissioned the church to do. That is what he commissioned you and me to do. That is the instruction that he has given to us. Therefore, we must, we should believe that word I hold to it. Don't doubt it now. Don't doubt it. I know that God is going to do something here. I believe it with all my heart. That God is going to do something here in this assembly. Because it is his word. It is not my word, it is his word. And if I stand, if you stand upon his word, he will fulfill that word to you. As we were told this morning, God watches for those that will believe that word. And that word will be manifested. 
He watches for those that will believe that word. He's like a seed. You know the seed. You know the seed is always watching for the soil. He's watching for the environment. And once the environment is right, it germinates. The seed, that's what the seed is. The seed is always watching. It's always monitoring the environment. Monitoring the environment. And if the environment is right, wow, it's proud. You buy potato, you put it in some dark, a little dark place somewhere there. You see, it's like you forgot about it. Just leave it. Let the environment be right. Let it not be too hot. Let it be right. What will happen? Even if there's no soil, that potato will sprout. <laughs> if you think that there's soil there, ah, it will start bringing out you know, leaves and everything. It's just the environment. It's watching. So all along, there's, there, there is a biological clock here or some kind of sensor that is sensing the environment. He's sensing the environment. And if it's right, it begins to sprout. So is the word of God. The original seed. The original seed. The word is, if you stand upon that word, that word will manifest itself. Because it's God's word that cannot return back to him. It cannot return. It just cannot. God said, that word will accomplish that which I please. It will accomplish it. That which I please. It cannot return. Praise be to God. The word of God cannot return. Jeremiah 29. I'm going to close soon. Jeremiah 29. Amen. Jeremiah 29. He says here, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace. That's what everybody is looking for. Is peace, right? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. You have an expectation. You have an expectation. The Bible said, my thoughts are to give you an expected end. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil. My thoughts are not, are not thoughts of evil. I do not plan evil against you. But my thoughts are to bring you to an expected end. And the expected end of God for you is to give you joy. It's to give you happiness. It's to fulfill the desire of your heart according to his word. And he will do it. Amen. He will do it. There is no power. There is not enough power he has to stand against the purpose of God in your life. There is no power. There is no power there. Now we were reading last week here. God said, I will fight against him. I will, I will contend, contend against him that contended against you. Anyone that contend against you, I will contend against that. Can we just do that again as we, we, we wind down now to close? Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, 24. Quickly. Isaiah 49, 24. <coughs> Isaiah 49. Yes, verse 24. He says, uh, Shall the prey be taken from the might, mighty? All the lawful, lawful captives are delivered. But thus saith the Lord, even the capti captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contended with thee, and I will, I will save thy children. That's the word of God. I will contend with him that contended against thee. And we are told last Friday that our job is to contend to stay in the word of God. Our duty is to, our struggle daily is not a struggle against some witches or some wizards. Our struggle will be how can I stay in the word of God? How can I make sure my thoughts are pure? My thoughts are holy. How can I make sure that the devil don't put wrong thoughts into my head? And all day, I am bothering myself with that. How can I make sure that my actions are right? 
That is my contention. That should be our contention, what we should contend for. Amen. How can I let the word of God dwell in my heart richly? How can I ensure that I think about the word of God always? That, that is what I should contend for. The others, God said, that is his job. I will contend with him that is contending against you. And when Jehoshaphat was, was contended against by some armies, some enemies, God said, Jehoshaphat, don't worry. I will save the city. And God went out and contended against the Amorites, against the Moabites, against all those that came against Jehoshaphat. God himself contended with them. God contended with them, and he destroyed them. They were all destroyed, because no man can contend with God and survive. There is nobody that will contend with God and will survive. And when God stepped out and contended with those that contended against Jehoshaphat, they were all, they all became dead men. So was Hezekiah, all those that contended against him, the king of Assyria contending against him. They all became dead men. 185,000 soldiers died in one night. Because God came down and said, you are contending with my son? Okay, contend with me now. Let us start the fight. They all died. So you leave that portion to God. He will contend against them. But you have to contend to stand on the word of God. Let the church contend to stand in holiness. To stand in the perfect love of God. Learn to appreciate one another. Praise be to God. And he will manifest his power in our midst. He has said it. He has given us a task to carry out. To go and preach the gospel. To go and demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ. To this dying world that we are living in today. We are given a task. To go and demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ. Demonstrate it. And the unbelievers will believe. Go and demonstrate this gospel. Go and demonstrate the power of Jesus Christ. To convince the unbeliever. And if we live the life of Christ. Certainly he will put a difference between you and the unbelievers. He will do it. I will do it. But he will do it. Everyone that stands upon the wall will be sealed by that wall. The devil can't get in. No. Except you open the door for him to come in. But if you are within the word of God, if you allow that wall to seal you around, the wall around you is the word of God, the devil has no way of coming into your life. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Let us rise up as we pray this morning.